Hello, I'm Bob Hanner, and I'll be talking to you a bit about biodiversity genomics. Malcolm mentioned that today is the International Day for Biodiversity. The United Nations defines biodiversity as this hierarchical combination of genes, species, and ecosystems that are around us on our planet. In our day-to-day -day lives, more pragmatically, biodiversity is what sustains us, nourishes us, what feeds us. Before we talk about how we use biodiversity genomics to study our food supply and its authenticity, though, we have to step back for a moment and talk a bit about the world's oldest profession, which is, of course, taxonomy, as is depicted in this uh, 13th century Italian fresco. Um, as long as humans have had language, we've been naming the species around us, typically as edible or medicinal or possibly poisonous. Uh, more recently, uh, as we've codified the science of taxonomy, we've had folks like Linnaeus give us our lingua franca for describing and naming species with Latin binomens. And uh, more recently still, Charles Darwin, through his thesis of descent with modification by natural selection, gave us a mechanism for the existence of species. In other words, species exist because they've evolved. Now, this is really important because, as Lord Robert May once said, without taxonomy to give shape to the bricks and systematics to tell us how to put them together, the house of biological sciences would be a meaningless jumble. Taxonomy and, and systematics are really fundamental disciplines to understanding biodiversity, but we practice them in ways that harken back to the era of Linnaeus and Darwin, looking at differences in shape, size, behavior, geographic range as a proxy to identify uh, species. Over 250 years of systematic study, we've described about 1.7 million species of plants and animals, but we don't even know to an order of magnitude how many species we share this planet with. Some estimates have ranged from around 10 million to perhaps 100 million. We've literally named more stars in the sky than we've described species here on planet Earth. And that's a bit of a problem given the alarming rate at which we're changing the habitat here. The job is getting simpler as species go extinct, uh, but we would like to be able to assess this grand challenge in biodiversity science of actually being able to circumscribe and name the biodiversity around us. Well, fortunately, just like their shapes tend to evolve and differ, species genomes diverge over time. And we can exploit these patterns of variation in the genome to help expedite our ability to identify and uh, describe biodiversity around us. That's what we do at the Center for Biodiversity of Genomics here at the University of Guelph. It's the international headquarters for the uh, barcode of life. Uh, my pol colleague, Paul Bear coined uh, the term DNA barcoding back in 2003 for using short, standardized DNA sequences as a means of telling species apart. And as we've gone around for the last decade building a DNA-based identification system for all of life on Earth, we've started to use it in some interesting ways, like asking the question, do you know what you're putting in your mouth? Um, maybe not. We've shown that food fraud uh, is more rampant than we once realized. We've seen a lot of seafood being mislabeled, species of a lower economic value being substituted for one of a higher economic value, or what we would call economically motivated adulteration. So my colleague Evan Frazier asked me, he said, well, you, you know, you've done studies showing this is a problem, but does that really happen here? So we went to a local sushi restaurant in Guelph, and every one of the pieces of butterfish and white tuna that we tested were, turned out to be escalar, a cheaper species that when eaten in more than a small amount can cause outbreaks of carrierrhea, gastrointestinal distress and an orange diarrhea, not what you'd normally expect when you're buying your sushi meal. So we've started to use our DNA barcode system to identify food fraud, and we've seen a lot of bad actors. In this case, farmed catfish coming from Southeast Asia uh, in the genus Pangasius has been mislabeled as just about everything you can imagine. Um, and this is a real problem because it distorts markets in a number of ways, and it also threatens sustainability. So the United Nations recognized DNA barcoding as part of their strategic plan 
to address uh, the, the challenges of identifying biodiversity back in the fall of 2016. But more recently, just last month, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization released an overview on food fraud in the fisheries sector and began, and they made a call for World Trade Organization to actually accept a, a harmonized DNA-based approach to identify uh, seafood and seafood fraud globally. And this is because we're seeing uh, problems with mislabeling allowing the laundering of illegally harvested species and being passed off as other things. Sadly, we can use this technology in, in very powerful ways, but sadly, Canada is doing a, a rather poor job of labeling our seafood compared to, say, our counterparts in Europe. And this lack of enforcement of labeling is what's allowing this illegally harvested seafood to be laundered into the seafood supply where in some cases we're seeing species at risk being passed off as other legal species. So this was the topic of conversation that Malcolm and I and other colleagues had at a, in a recent uh, science and technology policy workshop together with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. In my lab, we've been developing tools to be able to take this to industry. We can sequence seafood in a lab and ID it with barcoding, but industry tells me that to use this in real-time business intelligence, we have to be able to do this on site in real time. So we're exploiting species-specific patterns of variation in the DNA barcode to make molecular probes that we can use to authenticate various commodities that are the subject of fraud. And we've spun out the world's first DNA-based certification program for those companies who are looking to uh, take advantage of these tools and mitigate risk and, and differentiate themselves on the supply chain. So I'll just wrap up by leaving you with this little cartoon where the chef proclaims that its DNA is consistent with meatloaf. I, I chuckled at this cartoon when I first saw it, but as we started to do more of this kind of work with the CFIA, we've recently found that about 20% of the ground meat products that we tested from major retail sources across Canada actually contain meats that were not on the label. So we were finding pork in beef products, which is a problem for our kosher and halal consumers. We were finding uh, we were finding also beef and pork products, which is a concern when we have a foodborne illness outbreak. Typically, if we have an E. coli outbreak, we will recall beef, but we don't necessarily think to recall pork or other products. So in the end, this issue of what's in our food is really important, because if you have mislabeling, you have a food traceability problem. And if you have a food traceability problem, you have a potential food safety risk. And this is just one of the many ways that we're using the technology developed here at the University of Guelph uh, in Food from Thought. Thank you.